Go is a programming language. Many of us are very familiar with the specification. I want to use Go. I think it's pretty good. At the same time, kind of hard to ignore the browser in this day and age. Suppose you're writing a web application. You know, you start off by having some HTML templates, and then before you know it, you want to do a little bit of Ajax in the front end, and then you decide to turn the whole application into a single page apps, front end application, and then you're rewriting it in React, and before you know it, you're like, why not just rewrite the back end in JavaScript as well so that you can share some of that business logic. I didn't want to give in to those forces. There were two main reasons that were really uh, attractive to me and I wanted to keep. It is this refactoring uh, experience that you have when you're using Go. So you probably felt this. You're working in a Go project and you want to basically uh, take some Go packages, move them around, refactor them, and it's a really pleasant experience. Uh, the other thing that I really wanted to keep was the reusability experience. So imagine there's something that is common between multiple projects and you want to basically factor that out into a Go package and then be able to import it from multiple projects. I thought that Go already runs on multiple platforms, right? It runs on desktop operating systems and mobile operating systems. Uh, quite a lot of them, actually. So what about one extra one? This curious gopher really wants to jump in the browser. He's very eager. So what would it feel like uh, to think of the browser effectively as an operating system that we want to target? Luckily, we can have a little bit of an answer to that. So Gopher.js, it's a compiler that takes Go code and compiles it to JavaScript, which then runs in a browser. Uh, to give you a little bit of its history of support of the Go language specification, it was created in 2013, and it had everything except GoRoutines running. The most of the standard library tests were passing. It could compile itself. 2014 added GoRoutines, channels, and a select statement with a caveat. In 2015, that caveat was removed. And there's nothing left to do in terms of the language features in 2016. So I want to give a special thank you to Richard Musil. He's the creator of Go4JS. He did most of the heavy lifting and actually created it. So if there's anything that's cool or anything you like in his presentation, you should probably find him and thank him after. So a little uh, basics of what it's like to use Go in the front end. There is a JS package for accessing the JavaScript world. It is very similar to the C pseudo package, but it has the semantics of the reflect package. This is roughly what its API is like. You have your uh, object, which is a container for the native JavaScript object. You can convert it to a bunch of these types. And you can get a key or set a key, call a method, and so on. The package level global, that's the JavaScript's global object, so it's window and browsers. That lets you access and get to all of the other things inside the browser. So just to give you an idea, here's some simple JavaScript. And here's the equivalent. Uh, behavior, but using the JS package and Go. So something to understand here, just like there's a saying that C Go is not really Go, well, let me tell you, neither is JavaScript. It is not a lot of fun to use the JS package. It's not pleasant, but the good news is you only have to do this once. You do this internally inside of the wrapper libraries, but then you can expose these really nice and idiomatic Go APIs for the users. So there's already a lot of them created. There's uh, bindings for DOM, XHR, fetch, event source, WebSocket, too many to name. And let me just show you a few of them. So here's the DOM package that gives you the, the entire DOM API. There's a lot of uh, symbols there. And it kind of allows us to write the previous example in a slightly shorter way that's a little bit more type safe, friendly for auto completion. Here's my favorite one. Uh, there's a WebSocket package for accessing the WebSocket API. This is the API it exposes. It's a dial function that makes a WebSocket connection, blocks until it finishes, and then once it's ready, it gives you a net con. That's an interface. It's in a standard library. It's very easy to work with, and you can use it with the net RPC or the JSON RPC packages. Here's another one. If you want to make an XHR request, uh, with uh, Go4JS, it actually implements the HTTP client of NetHTTP, so you can just do HTTP get the URL, get the response. Do you notice anything? 
This is exactly the same Go code as you would write on the back end to make an HTTP request. It's implemented via fetch in the browser, or if not available, using XHR. So I want to give you three interesting examples or case studies of what it's like to use Go on the front end. So for the first one, let's think about what it would be like to implement IO Reader and an IO Writer in the context of a browser. Let's uh, port Ivy. It's this uh, APL-like language interpreter created by Rob Pike. Think of it as a calculator of sorts to run inside the browser. So it's a CLI command. That means what it needs really is just standard in, standard out, and standard error. Well, how would we do this? Uh, on the back end, uh, or inside of a desktop operating system, this is easy. We just have standard in, which is an IO reader that's implemented by being assigned to OS standard in. Standard out is an IO writer that's OS standard out. What would it be, though, if we're in the front end inside the browser? An idea is to use the DOM. So we can make a console of sorts that is just made up of a pre-element and an input element. So the standard output and error will go here. And we're going to get the standard in through the input. So that's just the HTML that I showed on the previous slides. There's nothing here, so it doesn't actually work yet. But that's what it looks like. It's already pretty close. So now let's work on implementing the IO writer that will write inside of these, uh, this pre-element. So we have new writer. It takes a pre-element and gives us back an IO writer. And the implementation is very simple. That's all it is. We're just going to take the existing text content of that pre-element and take P, append to it, and set that. What about the IO reader? That's where things get really fun. So we're going to have a pending byte slice like this. And we have an in channel of bytes, uh, byte slices. So the read method does the following. It checks if the length of pending is 0, which it will be initially, then we will assign to pending, uh, we'll receive a value from the in channel. And then once that's done, we'll just copy the rest into the piecewise. But wait a minute. We're going to receive from a channel. That's a blocking operation. But that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. IO readers are typically blocking until there is some input available. So what actually sends a value on that channel? Let's see. When we're creating that reader, we're taking the input element, returning IO reader. What we're going to do is add an event listener to that input event on the key down uh, event type. And whenever the user presses the Enter button, we'll just take whatever is in the input value plus a new line and send that across that channel, and then just clear it. So we can now put it all together. We'll just have this new file, constrain it to the uh, JS architecture. And in the init, we'll just say that standard in is that input element wrapped in a new reader. The output is the new writer, and that's assigned to standard output, and so on. And then this file, together with the rest of the Ivy code base, completely unmodified, will give us Ivy in the browser. So I can do this, and it computes it. We can take 2 to the power of 10,000. It's a really large number, but it gives us an answer pretty quickly. Do you notice something odd about this? When I take 5 plus 5, I get the answer, but the input kind of goes away. So the reason is that we're used to this, but most terminals actually take whatever is on the standard input and copy it over there. Copy that over to standard output. So an idea is to use IoT Reader to do exactly that. We'll just send a copy of standard in to standard output. And by doing that, we have fixed the problem. The second example I want to show you is streaming HTTP response bodies. So. Sometimes we want to make an HTTP request and then actually stream the response body, process it, and maybe even stop processing it when we find the thing we want and not download the rest of the response. Uh, if we're doing this in a backend, it may look like this in Go. We'll have an HTTP GET, and we'll just take the response body. It's already an IO reader, and we can just start streaming right away into standard output, for example. So how would you do this on a front end with Go? Well, remember, I said net HTTP, uh, the client is actually implemented using the fetch API, and it supports that in the browser. So this is exactly the same code you'd write on a front end to do this. So a real or a demo of using this could be to take this CSV file and try to stream it, parse it, and then find a value. 
So here's some JavaScript code that uses the fetch API to do this. Now, there's a lot going on here. Here's the fetch. There's a promise involved. There's a search function that calls itself. So there are callbacks. This is not the kind of uh, code that I'd want to write or read or review or refactor. So what if I rewrote this in Go? Then it starts to look like this. It makes an HTTP request, and it will defer closing the response body. So when we're done, it will get closed. Wrap that into a CSV new reader, and then just iterate over all the records until we find the, the one that we want. Calling that looks like this. It's just simple blocking code. It's very readable. So I like this a lot better. Uh, the third example I'll show is the ability to create really highly cross-platform libraries. Let's take a look at PackageGL. It supports macOS, Linux, Windows, iOS, Android, and modern browsers. That includes mobile browsers on your mobile devices as well as on the desktop. The way we do this is by using build constraints. So the, Mac, the desktop is implemented by constraining to the 3D6 and AMD64 architectures, and then implementing all the OpenGL uh, functions like this. You see go get OpenGL 2.1. The mobile ones are using these build constraints, implement the exact same external API, but using OpenGL ES 2.0 in this case. And for the browsers, we'll just constrain that to the JS architecture. And again, implement the same external API, but now we're going to have a WebGL context in the browser. We're just going to call a method on it in order to have that same behavior. So we're using WebGL 1.0. So with all that together, you can have a single code base written in Go that can absolutely run anywhere. So let's see an example of that. It's a little unfinished game I've created. You can see that it's running inside the browser. It's going to open the track and um, load the model, the textures, and then we have it running like this. So if you use your imagination, there's probably a little gopher inside that Harbourcraft. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, I can show you that it's actually uh, a Go program. It can also run on Mac OS. Here it is, the exact same code base, but running on a desktop. I'll talk a little bit about the challenges of using Go in the browser. The biggest one in my mind right now is that there's just no idiomatic React-like library for the front end written in Go. There are multiple works in progress, but it's just not there yet. There, uh, there are fewer Go developers in the world than there are JavaScript developers. <laughs> You're, you often end up kind of doing something for their very first time, and that can be fun. But if you want things to be uh, already ready, that's just not the case. The rest of the challenges, they're a little bit more go for js specific, but the JavaScript output can be somewhat large. So that makes it really viable for single page apps, but not so much for like little short scripts. You can't really put multiple scripts on the same page. But this can be improved with better uh, deck code elimination. The performance is generally really good. Sometimes it's actually faster to compile to the browser and have it run there. The V8 is an incredible engine. But there are some pitfalls you can fall into where the performance is up to 10 or 100x slower. Uh, finally, there's a separate build tool you use. Unfortunately, you can't just do go arch, JS, go build with a compiler equals to go for JS. Not yet. Uh, it's probably a small one, but. What does the future of Go in the browser look like? So Go for JS, it's an AST-based compiler. It looks at the AST of Go, and it targets JavaScript specifically. So it does a lot of work to make all the Go routines work and everything. It's ready today, and you can use it. But I think the best next thing that we can do is to target WebAssembly. We already know that many browser vendors have backed it. They're supporting it. It's being worked on. And it's likely going to be the next step. But it's just not ready yet. And it will not be Go4JS that targets it. It'll probably be another compiler. 
So I just want to conclude with saying that Go is a very easy language to like. It's a lot of fun, and it's actually possible and very viable to be an expert at it. Uh, that reference spec that I've shown, uh, the URL of, I think many of us have read it very carefully, and we know it pretty well. You have your static types, and you get compilable errors. So those are really great. They're very helpful. You have a great experience when you're doing refactoring. Uh, if you want to reuse something, a component between multiple projects, it's very easy. And you can write blocking code instead of having to write callbacks. A really cool uh, other aspect is that there's just no friction between moving between the front end and the back end. So it's like having a slinky where one day you can have something running on the front end, another day you decide to move it to the back end. You don't have to translate to a different language in order to have that, which means you can reuse some common business logic. And if you have some validation code that's running on the back end, the same code can run on the front end. You can share the same code for rendering HTML. You can use existing Go libraries or commands, as I've shown as well. And finally, you, you can keep using the same tooling, the same style, the same practices as you do on the back end. It's very familiar, and there's a lot of powerful tools for Go. So if you thought Go was fun in the back end, just wait till you try it in the front end. The browser makes for a really interesting and powerful operating system of sorts. There's all these new APIs, like there's web VR, so you can actually start doing uh, VR, virtual reality, inside of the browser. Maybe somebody will write some bindings for that. So I can honestly say that Go made me like front end programming again. Maybe you'll like it too. Thank you.